thank you all for coming out today and it's so great to see so many of my colleagues uh, from different areas from the university nursing and psychiatry from the Lawson and family uh, so what I'm talking about, one of my areas of research uh, that really impedes that issue of social integration for people with mental health problems is the issue where, unfortunately, many people end up homeless. And, and how does this happen? Um, but before getting into the content, as mentioned, I do participatory action research, so I never do research on my own. And it, as mentioned, it's very long-term partnerships. And so even though I stand here as an individual person, none of the research I, re I refer to did I do individually. It, it involved many people. Um, my community partners I've been absolutely blessed for. Some of them I've worked with for close to 20 years. Uh, Co-investigators, staff. Um, so without the, the support, I could not do the research I do. So one of the things before getting into it is to think about, is housing a right or a privilege? Uh, we talk about health care in Canada as being entrenched as a right. What, what about housing? Is housing a right? Um, now just as a clue, uh, the United Nations has declared housing a right and Canada has, has signed on to that declaration. It did take them quite a, while, quite a while, actually Canada was one of the last countries to sign on. It may uh, be a sign of some ambivalence there. Uh, but as we talk about this, to just come back to that idea, is, is housing, and especially in a country like Canada, in the winter we've had, to think about, is, is having a roof over your head a right or a privilege? So one of the issues that really has struck me over the years, um, having worked as a practitioner and working so hard to get people into the community, it's very disheartening to find so many people with mental illness actually ending up homeless. And, it's a very high proportion. Some studies in Canada found up to 75% of people in homeless shelters have a diagnosed psychiatric uh, illness uh, in terms of what, what we consider traditionally like depression, schizophrenia, and another 75% so obviously overlap with substance use. And when you look at that area of overlap, there's almost nobody that doesn't have either. Uh, for youth, uh, who arrive on the street even with no previous substance abuse uh, issues, it's six weeks before they're into IV drug use. Uh, so there's a very high correlation here. So why is that? Is it something about mental illness that predisposes people to homelessness? Is it something about homelessness, like that example, the IV drug use, maybe, that predisposes to mental illness? Or is there something about our societal response to both um, mental illness and homelessness uh, that, that is creating this problem. A lot of people say that homelessness is just too complicated, it's too complex to understand, nobody knows how to address it. Um, I always say if you can understand the game of musical chairs, you can understand what's happening in homelessness and come up with a strategy. So here's musical chairs, I'm sure you're, you've all played it at some point. So what I want you to think about is the chairs represent the amount of affordable housing within a community. That's housing that someone at the lowest strata of income can actually afford to live in and maintain the utilities. The people circling are the poor. Those are the people that need to access the housing at that lower level. The difference is going to be your homeless in the community. If there's not enough housing for people who need the housing, you're going to end up with a homeless problem. So when you think of it in that way, it's really not that complicated. Now, there, there is more to it. Uh, people often say in the homeless sector, it's, it's never only about housing, but it's always about housing. So what's happened to the chairs in Canada? Um, it, we've gone through a, quite a period of downloading. Um, so it's come from the federal to the provincial to the municipal level. Uh, you can go to buildings here in London that now say London Housing, that used to say Ontario Housing, that used to say Canada Housing. It's the same building, but that's what's happened as it's been downloaded. Uh, housing is a very expensive budget item, just as it is in your, in your own budget. It probably house, the housing related costs are probably a huge part of your budget. As well, on a government level, it's a huge part. So each government has been, played this kind of hot potato and moved it down through the levels as a way of getting rid of that expense. 
But what's happened as a whole is the actual amount, particularly of public housing being built, has rapidly diminished. So when we had Canada housing, we had as many as 100,000 public housing units being built across the country. When that got downloaded to the provinces, in some years that went down as low as 5,000. Now, you know when you build a house, it doesn't last forever. So if you're only building another 5,000 units, that's not even going to replace, really, what's going on. When Ontario downloaded to the municipal level, they also gave communities the option to opt out entirely. Um, prior to this happening, we did not have a homeless problem in Canada. Okay? So it, it's very important to look at that. Canada is the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have housing at that national level. So at the same time, so this is what happened to our chairs. So at the same time, what has happened to income supports? Well, we know one thing in terms of the economy, we have a lot greater problem, you know, although it's been a few ups and downs around unemployment. If someone has a mental health problem, they're most likely, if it's a serious long-term mental health problem, most likely relying on either welfare, Ontario Works, or disability, something like Ontario Disability Support. During the same period of that downloading, um, during the Harris years, welfare payments were actually cut by 25% at the same time as this um, public housing dried up. Uh, so in other words, we put a whole lot of extra people circling the chairs at the same time we were taking away the chairs. So. Sometimes musical chairs doesn't work out so well. So what was happening in mental health at this time? What we call deinstitutionalization. Some people would say it's not deinstitutionalization, it's dehospitalization, depending on where people end up. Um, theoretically ideal, but part of what, uh, so anyway, just to give you a sense, like we had in 1960 almost 20,000 psychiatric hospital beds. Uh, down to less than 2,000. Uh, and we went, in the period that that happened, there was, a, again, a gap of over a decade of no increase to community mental health funding. This happened at the same time as the, that policy change with housing and the same time as these changes in income support. So when you look at this, the question should not be why did so many people with mental health problems end up homeless, it's how could you possibly expect any other outcome. The problem is because these policies were happening in different areas, people were often not aware um, that these, these different issues were kind of creating a bit of a perfect storm. Um, the deinstitutionalization was certainly mirrored um, elsewhere, but whether or not home, uh, people with mental health problems became homeless was very much related to what was happening in those other areas, such as income support and housing. Um, this this is a, comes out from the Canadian Psychiatric uh, Research Foundation, heart disease, just another excuse for lazy people not to work. Imagine if we treated everyone like we treat people with mental illness. And I think this highlights some of the stigma and discrimination uh, that happens with people with mental illness. So in that game of musical chairs, some people have better access to the chairs than others. And stigma and discrimination, we know people with mental illness are the most stigmatized group in society when you look at who do you want to hire, who do you want to rent to, who do you want your daughter to marry, um, then someone with a mental illness is not there. So in that same game of musical chairs, there may have a, uh, even more difficulty grabbing what few chairs are there. Um, I often say to my students, because they often will be visiting people in their homes, and they can't believe the rent people are paying for such poor locations. And I remind them that they, students are often some of those people circling around. But a landlord, who do you want to rent to, that third year nursing student or the person with schizophrenia that spent 10 years in the psychiatric hospital? Now the reality is that person with schizophrenia is probably not going to have as many parties. Um, and, and may not trash the place. <laughs> like, so like the, we make it, but we make assumptions. And so it's the students as well, uh, especially in a community like this, that may be scooping some of those chairs as well. So what can be done about it? One of the things you do need to think globally and think of this larger policy context, but act uh, locally. And part of that thinking globally is to be thinking of it as a systems failure rather than a personal failure.
Um, to not take it down to that individual, it's because of what you are doing personally that you've ended up, rather than recognizing we have allowed this entire policy. And I, say, I mentioned about the United Nations um, stand on housing as a right. The United Nations has actually investigated Canada twice now for their poor housing policy. And this should be an embarrassment to all of us that our housing policy is so poor that United Nations has to come in a second time saying, what, what, what are you doing? But it's some of our most disadvantaged in our society that are really getting caught in this. In terms of acting locally, we need solutions that also cross sectors. Because the problem crosses sectors, so do the solutions. And we need to advocate for strategies that either increase the chairs or decrease the people. If we have strategies that just help one group grab the chairs faster than another, that does not solve the overall problem. And sometimes that's what happens. You have particular subgroups, so the policy is simply to allow one group to hit it, hit, grab the chairs faster. Um, but that will not solve the problem of homelessness. So how do you increase the chairs? I think the City of London has actually done a really good job. Uh, in the last several years, there's been major investments to increase the amount of public housing. And uh, also very much uses an evidence-based approach. We have a few cities across uh, the country that are really trying to make these kinds of investments uh, and um, looking at these evidence-based approaches. Those communities are bucking the national trend and are actually seeing a decrease in homelessness. In London, we're seeing fewer people in the last few years using homeless shelters, whereas in the rest of the country, it is still increasing. The use of rent subsidies we're using in our Homeless Veteran Project, um, where we're allowing people to access uh, market uh, properties, uh, which again is a way of increasing the chairs. Uh, we've had, we worked with the Sisters of St. Joseph in our Homeless Youth Project that simply provided a $50 rent gift that allowed people to access housing that they would not normally be able to house, but not be such a gift that they wouldn't be able to make it up at themselves after a year. This allowed them to go more into the neighborhood of choice so they could get out of the downtown core, away from the drug trade and the sex trade. So that $50 a month made a big difference as to the type of housing, which chairs they could grab. Um, examples of decreasing the people circling. We've had, um, we had a project uh, involving Ontario Works uh, and Canadian Mental Health Association where we set, uh, set up uh, a direct internet connection from our psychiatric wards where people could directly pay. Uh, the Ontario Works worker would come in and could access the Ontario Works database, so if someone's rent was in arrears or they needed first and last month's rent, they could do that right from the, the psychiatric ward. And through CMHA, we actually had, um, uh, 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 through the internet again, a log of every available um, apartment in London, so that even though there was a very short length of stay, we could quickly get housing, quickly get that paid for. Uh, by doing that, we actually reduced discharge to homelessness by, by uh, over 95% from our psychiatric wards. So it was a very important strategy to prevent people from circling around. Um, and thanks for those community partners. Uh, several projects with the City of London uh, we've got that we really use housing first and harm reduction. Housing first is a strategy where you say, instead of saying you gotta be good enough and then we'll get you housed, housing first says housing is a right. We'll get you housed first and then we'll worry about the other things. Uh, and that is very much an evidence-based uh, approach. That, um, and harm reduction is a way of dealing with substance use that takes people where they are and works with them to um, it may not be total absence if they're not ready for it, but you do things in a way. Um, like for example, one of our homeless veterans uh, projects, one of the veterans um, talked about having been on the street for 20 years and not having had a real alcoholic beverage that anyone else would consider an alcoholic beverage. Uh, hand sanitizer, uh, mouthwash, but not an alcoholic beverage. Now very proud being in a home that he's gone a year only drinking vodka as an alcoholic, which was a huge, so you can just imagine the pride he takes now, can say in the last year I've only had but no mouthwash, no hand sanitizer, no first aid alcohol. I don't know how he survived drinking 20 years of that. Um, and now I'm, maybe I'm ready to start cutting down on the vodka.
Okay. Uh, and anyway, so the, these projects, and as well, what we're working with um, on social enterprises, such with impact junk solutions, Goodwill, regional mental health, uh, to look at, with the social enterprises, what you do is we're actually creating jobs. So for example, in impact junk, uh, what they do is they have a junk removal service. Uh, where everybody who is employed there has a mental illness, they run the organization, they make a profit, and with the junk they move, they also uh, uh, fix it up and, and where possible, provide that to other people with mental illness. Uh, so it, again, it's a very good solution to help prevent uh, as many people from circling around those chairs. Um, so what I, we found archeological evidence that apparently musical chairs has been played for uh, hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, and the suggestion is perhaps we need to start playing a different game and be a little bit uh, more creative. So that is a very fast overview talking about why do we have so many people who have mental health problems or substance abuse that are homeless and some ideas about what we can do about it. So thank you.